This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. Do you drive a vehicle? Then you'll find AutoCorrect helpful, especially on Coach Charlie's Tip of the Week. Listen to our podcast with me, Coach Charlie Melton, on any podcasting platform or on the MPB Public Media app. MPB Think Radio. This is Southern Remedy Women's Health, where we discuss issues involving women's health. I'm Dr. Jasmine Kinsey, Assistant Professor of Internal Medicine and Pediatrics at UMMC. Happy Friday, everyone. I thought that I was going to be able to tell everyone, enjoy the beautiful weather today, but it literally started sprinkling. I guess that's the Southern term for just a very light, misty rain outside. So if it is raining where you are, please be sure that you are safe on the road today. Um, um, as well. So as anybody that was listening last week heard, this is American Heart Month. So February is the month where we focus on heart health. Last Friday was Go Red for Women, rem- reminding us of heart disease in women and how it does affect us as well. But as I mentioned before, February is just a wonderful month in general. We talk about heart health. We Valentine's Day, love, heart, all those things. Celebrating Black History Month as well. But as we talk about heart health, um, I want to point out that this is the American Heart Association's centennial year. So 100 years of great work with the American Heart Association um, and saving lives. So it's kind of so give, I guess, essentially, if you're at home, give them a round of applause for that. Um, for a hundred years of life saving work. For our history buffs out there, it was June 10th, 1924, that the American Heart Association was founded. And we spend this month focusing on heart health. I actually went to an event this past Saturday that was essentially Go Red for Women and discussing heart health. And one of our local pulmonologists, Dr. Joyce Wade, made a wonderful analogy about how our body is like a family. Family. Like we are family. And so everyone kind of talks about heart health month and all those things. But us as doctors know that the heart is part of something we call the cardiovascular system. So cardio being the heart, vascular being those wonderful tubes that carry the blood from the heart and then the wonderful tubes that return the blood to the heart. So today I have on with me Dr. Shukla, who is one of our vascular surgeons at UMMC. And so I want to welcome him to the show this morning. So welcome this morning. Thank you very much, Dr. Kenzie. I'm very happy to be here. Wonderful. Well, if you don't mind telling all of our listeners a little bit about yourself, where you're from, your family, what you do at UMC. Absolutely. So I am from Atlanta. I'm a board certified vascular surgeon. Uh, grew up in Atlanta. Spend a lot of my time all over the country with my training. Uh, my wife and our three kids just moved to Mississippi about nine months ago, and it has been an outstanding nine months. We've really built a great village for ourselves here, friends and family. Uh, I did my training uh, at Wake Forest for medical school and then came back to Georgia and Savannah. I did my general surgery training. Uh, and then after that, I went to the University of Vermont for two additional years of subspecialty training in vascular surgery uh, and was on faculty as my first job at the Medical College of Georgia. From there, I came here to join the uh, vascular division and help with the not only the uh, vascular care, but also with education of our trainees. So awesome. Well, welcome to Mississippi. Um, my joke for Mississippi are people that always n- that know me. It's something about you get here and they kind of just reel you in. So I, I laugh because I always say I found me a Mississippi man. And then now I am, I guess, officially a Mississippian. I'm from Alabama, but I've been here since 2011. Got th- had all three of my kids right here at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. So I think it's official. I'm a Mississippian. So That's great. we're going to work on you. It's been nice months but we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna keep you here the people are wonderful here and we are we've been so welcomed and we're just so happy to be here so we're gonna dive right in as i mentioned before um it's heart american heart month and we talk a lot about the heart but we always don't give a lot of attention to those arteries and veins so tell us a little bit about what you do what is vascular disease and- so i uh, we help patients who have uh atherosclerotic disease or blockages and arteries, 
uh, veins, everywhere outside of the heart and outside of the brain, from the mandible all the way to, below the jawline all the way down to the toes. We do, you know, if, if I think about how do I categorize our what we do, I think about the different systems. So the legs, we affect blockages, we take care of blockages in the arteries of the legs. So when you're walking and have pain in your legs, or if you have a wound in your leg and there's not enough blood flow to help that wound heal, we can help you with that. We also take care of the blood vessels in your neck that provide blood flow to your brain. So patients who have had a stroke because of blockages in their in the arteries in their neck, we help them. But also patients who have disease in the in those arteries that that is getting too too close to being uh, uh, putting them at risk of a stroke, we help uh, prevent the strokes. The other uh, area that we work on is aneurysm. So sometimes the arteries themselves can become weak because of smoking or uh, atherosclerosis or genetics, et cetera. And so when patients have aneurysms, we have ways of fixing those aneurysms uh, to so prevent them from rupturing and potentially uh, being fatal. And so we, have, we work all over the body in, in treating these blockages. Right. And I tell everyone, we think about, you know, we talk about heart attacks being blockages of the arteries in your heart, but you can have limb attacks. So you get blockages, you know, in whether that be in your legs. And we kind of talked about this before the show started, like loss of limbs, you know, the same idea. Um, you can get blockages in your other vessels. And then we think of uh, strokes, essentially brain attacks. Um, so blockages to your brain. And so essentially, um, Dr. Shukla and his team helps with all those things because they're all connected. That's right. That's right. We oftentimes are using the same analogy. It's a heart attack of your leg. It's a heart attack of your brain, etc. And that helps a lot. Awesome. So we talked a lot about, um, we were kind of chatting about some things that we see in both of our clinics and things that we see just kind of across um, the state. So what are some things that people can do to prevent the leg attack or, or you know, brain attack and those types of things? Great. I, mean, I think I think one of my biggest inspirations for becoming a doctor and really a vascular surgeon is, is prevention. So in order to prevent something, you have to see, well, what am I looking for? And that is with, with blockages in the arteries in your legs, if you have pain when you walk and, and, and your legs and it's limiting your ability to have, perform activities on a daily basis, that, that can be a manifestation of vascular disease of your legs. If you have a wound that does not heal or is taking a long time to heal or maybe even getting worse, that's a manifestation of vascular disease. If you were to have a stroke, uh, like symptoms, say sudden loss of vision in your eye, weakness on one side of the body, difficulty with your speech, that's a manifestation of vascular disease in the blood vessels that provide blood flow to the brain. Some of, uh, some of the vascular diseases, is, is you may not have a sign or symptom. Mm -hmm. There are patients who have come to see me that uh, had a, underwent a, re, a routine screening ultrasound for some other reason or were, in a, were unfortunately in a trauma and, got, and underwent a CT scan that incidentally found an aneurysm. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we, we really have no symptoms that they can attribute to that aneurysm. So... Then we think about what are risk factors for vascular disease. Risk factors are genetics is always a risk factor. Mm -hmm. So what I mean by that is if you have a family uh, member, first degree relative, let's say mother, father, siblings, the, that have uh, an aneurysm or have a manifestation of vascular disease, that's when we start to think about you should ask your primary care doctor for screening mechanisms or a referral to us in vascular surgery to screen for an ultrasound or, or uh, screen for an aneurysm or monitor an aneurysm. The other thing is, uh, what are risk factors in, in lifestyle? So smoking. Smoking is one of the biggest risk factors for development of vascular disease history of hypertension mm -hmm. and diabetes. Those two are also big manifestations of, of vascular disease. And finally, I worry about uh, most of my patients have that have chronic kidney disease also have manifestations of vascular disease. So looking at family history and then personal medical history as, as um, uh, factors for screening criteria for vascular disease is what's important. Good. And so I tell my patients all the time and then my listeners that are listening on the show, when we talk about risk factors, there are some things that we can't change. And um, just like Dr. Shukla said, um, you know, genetics is a huge risk factor for many of 
many health problems in general, but I try to remind myself, what are things that I have control over? And so those are all the wonderful things that we talk about in prevention. And and I tell patients all the time, surprisingly, I don't want to give you medicine. <laughs> um, you know, there are ways that I can still stay employed without giving you medicine, working on, you know, preventing things that happen in your life, controlling your blood pressure, quitting smoking, you know, all those things that not just like I mentioned before, affect the heart, but affects all those blood vessels um, that essentially go throughout the body. So you talked a lot about prevention. And I say this to like when I entered medical school and even though medicine is my occupation, when I entered medical school, I think in my mind I made all surgery the same, like you go to school, you become a surgeon. Um, and so I think patients do that as well. So you mentioned a little bit about vascular surgery. How is that different than like the general surgeon? So that's, so that's a good question. So in our world, we're, we're operating on blood vessels that are, any, are, are anywhere as small as two millimeters in size to up to, up to 10, 12 centimeters in size. So we're operating on something as small as your pencil the tip of your pencil to to uh, as big as as big as a grapefruit and so we the additional vascular surgery training of two years that i underwent it did a few things for me it it not only reinforced some of the principles i learned in general surgery of navigating the different parts of the body um and uh but it also helped me refine my skills on microvascular or mic microscopic surgery and also endovascular surgery. Well, what's endovascular surgery? That's where the wires and catheters and stents and all the tools that we use by going through the inside of the artery or inside of the vein and using sort of a minimally invasive approach uh, to fix some of the problems. So mm -hmm. I give the classic example, the treatment of abdominal aortic aneurysms or aneurysms of any part of the body has has evolved from the big incision, make big a big cut down the middle of your belly to open up your 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 belly and fi find the aneurysm and replace it with a tube graft, to now two two incisions in your groin that often are one to two centimeters on size, and a stent that's now excluded blood flow to that aneurysm and patients are going home the next day, so the the. The evolving technology in vascular surgery is what is a significant part of our tr additional training so we can become facile with that. Because what we want to do is we want to help patients with these diseases they have, and we want to minimize risk, and essentially so that we can get the maximal benefit, maximize their survival, maximize their uh, quality of life. Perfect. And that's one thing I try to reiterate when I have my patients and my family members, because the first thing people say is, I don't want anybody cutting on me. And I'm like, we're, we've come a long way in medicine. But so for all the people that may just now be listening, I was reminding everyone that this is American Heart Month, where we focus on heart health. But as I mentioned earlier, that when we learn about it in medicine, it is the cardiovascular system. So the heart cannot function with all of the wonderful system that supports it, and that's our vascular system. And so I have got one of our UMMC vascular surgeons here, Dr. Shukla, who has been sharing a lot with us about what is vascular disease, what do vascular surgeons do. We talked a little bit, um, Dr. Shukla, about just different things that um, – vascular surgeons do and how that differs from general surgeons in general. So um, I think it's a great opportunity for us just to talk about some common procedures that you do, because I don't think patients realize what options are out there for them. We talked a lot about prevention as well. Um, so what are some of the common procedures that you do in your practice? Great. Good, good question. So again, I, I think through the different systems that we we treat disease on. So if I was to start from head to toe, so when we think about carotid disease, the carotid artery is an artery in your in your neck. So the ways, the, what we're trying to achieve there is to remove the blockage that could potentially put patients at risk of a stroke or could have caused the stroke. So the ways we treat that are, are, are mainly two mechanisms. One is open up, uh, make an incision in the neck, uh, get down to the artery, open up the artery, and and remove the the blockage. And then we close it, and uh, thereby reducing the risk of a stroke going forward. We really can't fix a lot in the in the past. We can really prevent things from getting worse. The, so with every, with that with that surgery, and a, a theme I'll have for the rest of the other things we do, is the alternative is to put a stent in. 
let's say the let's say you you the patient has multiple other medical problems that may potentially make them a little sick uh, too sick for that operation mm-hmm. or their anatomy is too high for us to access with an, an incision in the neck those would be patients that we think about doing a stent okay. so then as we move down we think about aneurysms so and we can have aneurysms in any artery that's throughout the body but the, the most common ones that we we see um are thora- in the thoracic aorta so in the chest mm-hmm. and in the belly and so again the me- the mechanisms of treatment for these aneurysms are either we make an incision in the in between the ribs and the chest or make an incision in the in the belly but the less and most less invasive and more common practice is to make um, to, uh, take a needle and make a needle stick in the in the artery in your groin and then when we we put a sheath up to deliver a stent and that stent is is bare metal but it also has a fabric around it and the mm-hmm. thought is that now that fabric is covering the artery so that blood flow to that aneurysm is no longer present so that pressure on the aneurysm is absent okay. de- decreasing its risk of uh, rupture again continuing down down from head to toe we think about the legs and so and and although you can have blockages in your arms there it's more common in the legs so when we have blockages in the arteries in your legs that's what that that decreased blood flow to your feet to your toes to your legs results in pain because think if we don't have blood flow to our legs it's kind of like when we work out mm-hmm. when we're lifting weights what's happening we're really overwhelming our our arms with the weight and so you're so sometimes your blood flow your oxygen levels can't keep up so that's the same thing that's happening it's like you're not without lifting weights your your legs are working uh, uh without as much oxygen so what do we do well in some some parts of the body we make an incision cut down to the level of the artery open the artery remove the blockage and then put a patch on there to thereby getting rid of that blockage going from 660 70 80 90% blockage mm-hmm. to zero and sometimes we do the same thing make a needle stick in the groin go up and over to that leg get through the blockage fix it by either uh shaving down the blockage or putting a stent there or using a balloon to open up that blockage. So now what we've done is essentially taken a blockage within the artery that's again 70, 80, 90%, used a balloon, used a shaving mechanism, used a stent and and basically crushed that blockage to now zero and now you've got much better blood flow to the leg. Awesome. And sometimes we have to create a new new in, new highway where we take a piece of vein or plastic and create a new route because the blockage is too severe. Gotcha. Well, it looks like we actually have our first caller. So we have Sarah from Columbus. Good morning, Sarah. Good morning. How are you this morning? I'm good. Good. Tell us a little bit about your question. Well, uh, I, I heard I heard you speaking about the aneurysm and uh, uh, testing for that and and. Uh, likely to get it if somebody in your family had had it. And what my father died with an aneurysm. And but my doctor has told me that it's primarily a man's disease. Uh he did do some checking but uh uh he he should I wor- should I worry about it or should I be more thoroughly checked out? Yeah, so Sarah, good morning. Um, Mernal Shukla here, and it's such a such a good question you asked. So, so I think I'm sorry that your father passed away from an aneurysm, and I. I but what's what? Like anything in life, it's a good and bad, and 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 that is that that's a good sign that we should try to screen you for an alt, uh, for an aneurysm. So, you know, base, a lot of times the U- United States Preventative Task Force so a group has come up with some guidelines that says that family members of of patients first degree like your father who have an aneurysm should be screened with an ultrasound uh for and so getting an ultrasound done to l- determine whether you have an aneurysm is sort of the first step I would do the nice thing about ultrasounds is they're not invasive so and um they're re- relatively easy to access and so the, what I would do is it to um go to your primary care doctor and ask them that I have a first degree relative I heard a vascular surgeon on the radio said that I would qualify for a screening ultrasound and undergo that 
as far as should you worry about it, I think less worry, more aware. And and then if you need help, certainly come down to the University of Mississippi. We'll be happy to to take care of you. There's one more question you asked me. Oh, yes. Um, It is. So aneurysm disease is more common in men than women. But what we know from our from our research and from our literature is women tend to be um, uh, uh, less symptomatic with these with these aneurysms, and so sometimes it that that sometimes results in delay of presentation or later presentation. Um, the one thing I will say to you, Sarah, is that and when we think about aneurysms, especially abdominal aortic aneurysms, our our criteria for fixing these aneurysms is a smaller size than men. Because our literature has shown us that the risk of rupture is higher in women at, at, a, at the size of five centimeters than the classic five and a half centimeters in men. So the short answer to, to your questions, which, is, which are fantastic questions, is I think a screening ultrasound of, of your, of, to start uh, of, of your abdomen or your belly ultrasound to determine whether you have an aneurysm would be where I would start. And certainly... Uh, being aware of it, both men and women, is important, remembering the first-degree relatives or any history of smoking. That's the other thing that the U.S. Uh, Preventative Task Force sp- talks about. Anybody that smokes more than 100 cigarettes in their life, mm-hmm. that's one risk factor for developing aneurysms. Great question, Sarah. Okay, I don't believe so. I don't believe I have any more questions. I think this, this will help. Okay. You have a great day. You have a great day. We appreciate Thank your you. question. Thank you. Yep. And so I will say this, um, Dr. Shukla, as we talk about, you know, men and women, all those things, it gets to be challenging because the recommendations are different. Um, and so thank you so much, Sarah, for your question, because just like Dr. Shukla says, when you have a family history, that kind of, you know, that light goes off to say, maybe I should be more aware of this. Um, but the United States, as uh, Dr. Shukla mentioned, Preventive Task Force recommends the ultrasound screening. Um, and we do that in primary care for prevention. But as of now, that screening, they say for men between 65 and 75. But if you're, we tell everybody, we call it the wonderful shared decision making, having that conversation with your doctor about your family history and your concerns and your worries is helpful. We kind of think back to ourselves, right? So my family, I I shared with you, my inspiration for going to medicine is my grandfather's cardiac disease and access to Mm -hmm. care. So, so for me, when I go to my doctor, I, I, I'm focused on that. Mm-hmm. Well, if I, it's, it's in the same way. Your loved one has an aneurysm. Well, that's going to be the focus of my care when I go to my primary care doctor if I was in that situation. Exactly. Um, and so so I guess we, we started talking a little bit about um, some of the procedures you do. And we talked a lot about probably one of the common ones you see is when you're having problem in vascular disease in your legs. Um, and just like we can in the heart, we put a stent in the heart. You commented on we can put stents in the legs and we can do some maneuvers to redirect the blood flow if we need to. So how do I find out if I have a blockage problem? Like what is my doctor? are going to do to figure that out. Great. So, uh, you know, a lot of primary care doctors that I've spoken to, endocrinologists, will do what's called an ankle brachial index as a screening for peripheral arterial disease. So what that what does that mean? Well, we check your pressure and your, your, your blood pressure in your arm, and then we compare it to checking blood pressures in your legs. Oftentimes, you take the blood pressure cuff, put it around the ankle, and listen for the signal uh, on uh, where the artery is at the top of the foot or on the side of the uh, leg. And the ratio there oftentimes should be more than 90%. Well, if it's less than 90%, what that means is that you've got some blockage somewhere between your heart and your toes that's decreasing the amount of blood flow that's being delivered to your toes. And then depending on where that range is, that's when we start to consider some uh, treatment for it. Well, remember, treatment is always, as a surgeon for me, treatment is always medical and then maybe surgery. And so, but it's always going to be medical because I'm always going to talk about prevention. I'm always Mm -hmm. going to talk about maintenance medications to decrease your cardiovascular risk. And then also some of the medications to maintain what I, or keep open what I, what I uh, did. So once we get that ratio, um, that'll, that'll indicate to your primary care doctor or your endocrinologist that, 
a referral to vascular surgery should be should be placed and and that's when we come and see you in the office and we ask you well listen your ankle brachial index is low are you having any pain when you walk around mm -hmm. in your legs are you having any pain when you're at rest in your legs cramping pain in your legs are you do you have wounds that just won't heal no matter what you do um, and those would be the, that would be some of the screening things we talked about screening with with Sarah on aneurysms with an ultrasound and family history smoking etc um, and certainly uh, with the lower extremities it's really the ankle brachial index that does is the workhorse for us if you will I love it and so I remind my patients all the time so get things checked out if you're if you're cramping up a lot I have everyone they'll, they'll call me and they're cramping and they're like I need my potassium checked or I, or I drank you know I ate some bananas or did some mustard and I'm still having pain and I'm like you need to come see me we need to talk about that some more so as a, you hear me on the show every Friday if there's something that's bothering you don't brush it off talk to your doctor about it because this cramping those leg pains could be signs of blockages especially if you have those risk factors absolutely from MPB Think Radio, this is Southern Remedy Women's Health, where we discuss issues involving women's health. I'm Dr. Jasmine Kinsey, Assistant Professor of Internal Medicine and Pediatrics at UMMC. And today I have on with me Dr. Manal Shukla, who is a vascular surgeon at UMMC. And we have had a great discussion so far, learning a lot about what vascular surgeons do, what they can offer us for prevention, um, and what procedures um, they do as well. Me and Dr. Shukla were talking a little bit. And so we've talked a lot about um, the arteries in our leg. We actually honestly have talked a lot about the arteries. We haven't told, talked a whole lot about the venous system. So tell us a little bit about some things that you see when we talk about the venous system and, and venous disease. Yeah, so the venous system behaves a little bit differently. Although it, it's blockages, we think a lot about uh, not only blockages, but also the consequences of blockages because now we're now we're going in a different direction. So mm -hmm. now we're going arteries go from the heart down to the toes. Now we're talking about blood going from the toes back to the heart. And so a lot of times when patients have a, a, the developed disease in the venous system, they develop in the form of a blood clot. Um, mm -hmm. They develop in the form of consequences of blood clot. Or, and so what does that mean? Well, you may have had a distant history of a blood clot in your veins, and now what's happening is you're getting pain in your legs when you walk around, but we can feel your pulses in your feet or your ankle brachial index is normal. Well, what does that mean? Well, a lot of times when you have blockages uh, uh, going up, the blood tends to reflux down towards your legs. Mm -hmm. So that that will... Uh, produce swelling, and that swelling, it's it's a lot of times it's congestion. For me, my world is traffic, right? So there's traffic that can't get blood flow to the toes. There's traffic that can't get me back home to the heart. Mm -hmm. So how do I get back? How how do I deal with that, that that traffic? Well, a lot of times the swelling can cause you to have pain when you're walking around. So the big big thing for us in venous disease, the manifestations are often swelling, varicose veins. Um, wounds that develop because of that swelling. Mm -hmm. And so for the, it's a different mechanism of treatment for us with the vein system. Uh, we rely heavily on veins in the venous disease with compression and elevation. I can't really accept a lot of our patients just stay in bed there with their legs up, up at the ceiling. But what we can exp uh, help them with is giving compression stockings, mm -hmm. uh, prescribing compression stockings or having compression wraps. I have a number of patients in my clinic that have wounds uh, because of venous uh, disease, that I routinely have uh, uh, prescribe una boots or, or compression medicated compression wraps. Okay. And our nurse practitioners and our nurse, Miss Miss Rogers, she does she does such a great job with putting on these wraps and mm -hmm. changing them. And our nurse practitioners do a good job of of, of prescribing compression stockings and uh, providing uh, options for where they can access it. Uh, and educate with with uh, the, that being the fundamental for treatment of venous disease. Well, perfect. Well, it looks like we actually have a couple of callers. So we're going to move to our first caller, Miss Shirley from Grenada. Good morning, Miss Shirley. Good morning. How are Good you? Morning. I'm doing okay. I'm okay. What's your question this morning? Well, my question is, well, I'm going to tell you the incident that happened, and then you might be able to help me out more fully. My thing is, I was having a hot flash on, at, sitting on the foot of my bed, and I reached up to turn the ceiling fan on, 
my body all of a sudden just start jerking like and like a friction sound came of it, like electrical shock or something or seizure. And then when I sat back down, my legs start swelling all at once and it got stiff and sore and I couldn't walk on it. And then when I finally start walking, I was walking with a drag. And when this was during the time the snow was on the ground and when I finally got to the ER, they moved it out as if it was just a Operators or something, operators with some fluid on my leg. Mm-hmm. I want your opinion. What do you think? Does hot flashes have anything to do with uh, venous insufficiency? So I'll answer the first part of your uh, p- part of your question, and then I'll, I'll ask Dr. Shukla about the hot flashes and venous insufficiency. That I'm not sure, but um, I would probably say, you know, usually the ER, at, and I and I've shared this a few times on the air. Like my husband's an ER physician, so I hear this quite a bit. So usually ER, we try to make sure that it's not life threatening that's causing your symptoms. So if you're still having problems from that event pain, swelling, or weakness, then you definitely need to get back in your doctor, so that, in with your doctor, so they can examine you and see if something else is going on, you know, based off of, you know, maybe you injured a knee, hip, or something like that, and that's why the ER is thinking arthritis, and that pop or sensation that you had is related to that. But if you're still having ongoing symptoms, you need to follow up with your doctor to see if something else is going on. Because it's really, I'll be honest, Miss Shirley, it's really hard to say. Um, you know, as a doctor, I tell people we like to get a good history, but our exam is the follow up to that history to really pinpoint exactly what's going on. So if you're still having problems, I, I want you to try to get in with your doctor, okay? Oh, yes, I've gotten in with my doctor. You know, uh, and they're supposed to be doing tests on it, but Perfect. they haven't got to that yet. But I'm, yes, I am still having problems. Yes, it. ma'am. Well, I would but definitely I'm say. Saying, I got one question for you. Yes, ma'am. But do arthritis come up on you all of a sudden when you haven't had any problems at all as far as arthritis? Yes, ma'am. So I tell people arthritis flares like anything else. It's it's chronic, and so you can be going on just fine, and then out of nowhere your knee can swell sometimes. You can have a lot more pain. So arthritis can do that. But I also want to make sure I get to the second half of your question because I haven't seen a connection between hot flashes and vascular disease. Anything on that, yeah, Dr. Shukla? Yeah, Ms. Shirley, that's a tough one, but I would echo uh, what Dr. Kenzie said. Was uh, we uh, What's really helpful to us is... Uh, getting more of a history and and really the physical examination because the legs, although the legs uh, pain can be and swelling can be related to veins and arteries, but there are different parts of the legs that are also present. Well, there's muscle and bone and nerves and whatnot. So I think, I don't know that they're readily off the top of my head that there's a connection, uh, but but what, what I will say is that the primary care doctor is so helpful for us because they they have a, a a a general approach to many of the causes for leg swelling and then they have the mechanism to refer to the proper person that subspecializes in that so for example if your primary care doctor does determine that it's related to vascular disease they have the mechanism to refer you to us for further evaluation and subsequent treatment all right. Well, Miss Shirley, we truly appreciate your question. I've got a few more callers that I want to try to get to before the hour is over, okay? Oh, yes. Yes, Thank ma'am. You. Well, make sure you follow up with your doctor and take good care of yourself, okay? Thank you. All right. Thank you, Miss Shirley. Well, I'm going to move on to our next caller. We've got Don and Jackson. Hey, Don, how are you this morning? I'm fine. Thank you for taking my call. Yes, sir. Tell us a little bit about your question. Okay, uh, about two years ago in September, actually it's longer now, September 2020, I had uh, blood clots in my left leg, and they traveled to my um, lungs, and I had what they call the double saddle block. So I had to go to the ER, get treated. I spent about three or four days in the hospital. And now I take Ellis as a blood thinner as sort of a preventive. But and I, every now and then I will see... I'll see the hematologist because we thought it might be genetically related, but we didn't find any genetic connection. But my concern is every now and then I'll have a little discomfort in that left leg, like uh, like um, if I sit for a prolonged period, and sometimes maybe when I'm walking for a prolonged period. So I also wear compression stockings now. I try to wear them pretty regularly, especially if I'm going to do a lot of sitting. And uh, I haven't had the 
my last check for blood clots in a while. I do see my regular physician uh, about twice a, twice a, um, a year. And I was just sort of thinking, should I, should I actually check those veins and, and, and have other veins checked? I'm thinking more from a, from a preventive standpoint, like you were describing. You know, it's one thing to react and treat it on an acute basis, but I'd rather prevent it if I can. Yeah, good, I want to good, on that. good question, Mr. John. So, um, I think for me, when I think about uh, the situation you've been through and said, boy, that sounds scary, I think you're already doing a lot to prevent it. You're doing the compression stockings. You're walking as much as you can. You're on blood thinner. You're doing, it, you're doing, you're doing great. Adding an image uh, like an ultrasound, we have to, sometimes we have to, be, we have to be judicious about what we, what we order. When we order an ultrasound, I, tell, I teach my residents and the, and the fellows that we train for vascular surgery, if you're going to order something, you want to have an action plan on what, how that, that image is and the result of that image is going to affect your management. Because like anything in life, there's nothing free, and it, it, it costs not only the patient money but time and travel and adjustment of their schedule to come get that ultrasound. So the times when I think about getting an ultrasound for you is when you've done everything that you're already doing, compression, uh, uh, walking, being, on your, being compliant with your blood thinner, and then things get worse, that's when I would think about getting an additional ultrasound for you. But I think you're doing all the right things, and I really commend you for keeping your compression stockings on. Okay, well, I'll uh, just very quickly, um, I'll keep that in mind, but I don't mind if I have to, you know, do private pay for the ultrasound just to be sure there isn't something else in a different spot because I think about that as well. Believe me, it was pretty traumatic to go through that. I and bet. Once you, get that, you don't want to go through that again. You'd like to prevent it if at all possible. Gosh, yeah, so, I'm really sorry you have to go through that. All right, well, thank you. I appreciate the information. Have a good day. And I'm going to say, Dr. Shukla, along with that, another question that I've gotten is pe people will ask, is there a difference between them getting over-the-counter compression um, socks versus the prescription ones that you guys mentioned? And is one better than the other? Or yeah, Great question. So the, the key for me is uh, the grade of the compression stocking. You know, I think we, there's, there's uh, 20, I think about... The different grades, which is which is five to ten, ten to fifteen, fifteen to twenty, and then the twenty to thirty, it really depends on what you're trying to achieve. I wear compression stockings routinely, and I wear the, I, I wear them because I'm on my feet for most of most of the day. Sometimes long operations. My patients who have venous disease, I try to get them to wear twenty to thirty millimeters of mercury, and oftentimes that requires a prescription. Really, I give the prescription because then they can go and see wherever they're going to buy them. Okay, this says 20 to 30, this says 15 to 20. Okay, I need to get that one because that's what my physician recommended. So, so the grade of the compression stocking is, is important because if there's not enough of that compression, it may not overwhelm the degree of disease or reflux that you have in the veins. And what we don't want to, what we really want to do is the way compression stockings work is they, they, they give external pressure on the veins. And then you're inside your legs, your muscles will, as they flex, they give additional pressure, all in all helping the blood go back to the heart. And awesome. so we want enough pressure, external gradient pressure, to help with the uh, uh, swelling. All right. And I'm going to jump right into questions because Robbie has been waiting patiently. Well, uh, Robbie, how are you doing this morning? I'm good. Thank you. Wonderful. Tell us about your question. Okay. Um, my late husband... Um, his family had terrible vascular disease in his family. <clears throat> his father had several heart attacks and, and bypass, um, had his neck arteries done. Um, my mother-in-law died of a heart attack. My husband had a fem pop when he was in his 40s, about 45, in his leg. He had a, the bypass. Um, and he died at 54 of a heart attack. Uh, no, excuse me. He had a heart attack at 54, and then when he died, he was during he was having heart surgery and, and bled out during surgery. Um, he also had hepatitis C, so he should never have had the surgery because his blood wasn't clotting. But that was his choice. He had a sister that had a heart attack at 36 and died, and another that died in his in her 50s. Um, there's only one sibling left of the four, and it's all been heart related and their parents. 
I have a 37-year-old son who has had uh, an aneurysm, brain aneurysm, and I have a 34-year-old daughter. Um, my son had his aneurysm about five, four or five, maybe six years ago. Um, my question is, at, at what point does my daughter at 34 um, need to be checked uh, for any of the cardiac vascular issues? Um, and then what follow-up do they both need to do? Yeah, so that's a great question. First of all, I am so sorry to hear about your 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 husband. It sounds like you've been through a lot, um, and and I'm so happy that you're you're calling us today for prevention for your kids. I think I think when when should your daughter be checked now? Uh, I think I think now is the perfect time. You know, 34 years old, having a primary care doctor is extremely important because again, big thing for me. If you remember anything from this show, is prevention. Uh, we we and we have to take uh, take uh, control of our own uh, health. And so what I would start with is I would start by going to the primary care do- or her primary care doctor or establish uh, a primary care doctor uh, that can then do a first set of routine labs. In. And with that history, that primary care doctor, I would encourage you to tell that person that I really would like to get my cholesterol numbers checked. I'd really like to uh, uh, see if I my cholesterol levels are are high, and and if so, what can I do to to improve that? In addition to diet and exercise, are there any medications that I I, I need? But I think that the time is now, uh, Miss Robbie, and and uh, it's perfect to start with the primary care doctor. Okay. Well, they both, I believe. Uh, I know my daughter does has a primary care doctor, and her cholesterol and stuff was checked with. Her OBGYN. Um, <clears throat> my son, I'm not real sure. He works construction, and I don't think at the present has insurance. So his thing is, oh, I'll get to it. I can't afford it right now. And I'm, I'm to the point of saying, I will pay for it if you'll go do it. <laughs> because he's already had the aneurysm. My dad have a, had an abdominal aneurysm. So I was listening to that, and I'm going to be sure and talk to my primary care doctor for myself. But it's the vascular uh, diseases that run in my husband's family and now my son um, is so extreme. And I want them to do whatever is necessary to stop it before it gets to the point of heart attacks and aneurysms and things. So, well, well, I got to um, tell you, you're a great mother uh, for, for calling in today. And, um, you know, one of the things that uh, I want to I wanna tell you is that anything we can do at the University of Mississippi, especially in the vascular division, to help you with that, with screening ultrasounds or, and whatnot, please let us know. But remember, remember, um, Dr. Kenzie and I were talking about um, mothers are so so great. They take care of everyone in the house, the, the children, the husband, and uh, sometimes even the dog or cat. But I think remember to take care of yourself as well so we can prolong uh, uh, your ability to, to do such a good job of taking care of everyone else. During the, the discussion about the abdominal aneurysm, I am going to be sure and mention that to my doctor the next time I go in. And um, I just retired and, and have Medicare, so now I'm going to go have my physical. Perfect. So I'm going to be sure <laughs> and bring that up during the discussion of my dad's aneurysm. So um, I appreciate the information. Yes, thank ma'am. You so well, much. thank you yeah. so much for your question, Robbie. And okay. David, I apologize. You've been so patient on the phone with us. I will talk to you once we're offline um, with your question. Um, we appreciate all our questions this morning. But Dr. Shukla, we talked a little bit about what all do you guys offer for for our patients? Yeah, so that's perfect. So, I've, you know, I'm, I'm very, very fortunate, as they say in the South, I'm very blessed to have a great team of uh, nurse practitioners, a great senior partner who brings wisdom with experience. We also have a, a, a vascular lab that uh, provides our, uh, my ability to see the patient but also get the testing I need, not only for screening but also for surgical planning and for, sur- for maintenance of surgeries that I've done uh, to make sure that uh, whatever I have done doesn't fail. Um, the big thing is also coordination of care. Our nurse practitioners do a good job of finding a list of specialists within University of Mississippi or close to home for the mm-hmm. patient for referral. 
uh, should they need any additional care. And, and so we're happy to help you in any way, but risk factor modification is the big thing for us. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Myrnal Shuka, for coming on today with us. Um, Southern Remedy Women's Health is a production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting Think Radio, and it's funded in part by a grant from the University of Mississippi Medical Center and generous support from listeners like you. Today's show was engineered by Abram Nani. I'm Dr. Jasmine Kinsey. Join us next Friday at 11 for Southern Remedy Women's Health, and stay tuned for NPR's Here and Now, coming up next on MPB Think Radio. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand.